good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Profound States. Tonight's special guest is Jocelyn Buckner. She's a writer, photographer, uh, UFO researcher, and life lifelong contactee. She was mentored by Dolores Cannon, pr uh, practices QHHT, is a writer, and her articles have been uh, published in numerous magazines and newsletters. Uh, she has paranormal vortex tours in Sedona and has been featured on internet radio shows and CNN tra travel. She is now retired um, after working as a UFO and vortex tour guide for the past 20 years and has been giving psychic readings for over 45 years. Welcome to tonight's show, Jocelyn Buckner. Hi, Charles. How, how are you this evening? I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, it's It's been a beautiful day, nice and warm. I've been outside working in the garden. And uh, it, so it's wonderful being in Sedona. It's got a nice vibe to it. So I guess we can go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, what's the very first odd experience in your life of any kind, you know, very odd or strange? Well, I guess that would be when I was very small. Now, let me um, let me take two steps back. I was born into a household that uh, studied UFOs. My mom and dad were in Saint uh, 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 Shasta, and uh, they were out for a picnic. And this was before I was born. It was in the early 1950s, and my mom saw three discs come out of Mount Shasta. And, uh, of course, when by the time she woke up, my dad and he got up on his elbows, all he saw was like little dots in the sky. And he said, oh, well, those are ours, you know, uh, and uh, have you heard of the Nazi bell? Remember, this is only a, a few years after um, they came home from World War Two. So my dad had been in Germany. I don't know what he saw, but he saw something unusual, he said. And uh, my mom was in the Coast Guard, and she saw something off the coast of Florida that caused her to be um, uh, transferred up to Connecticut, where uh, she was in a group that was looking for certain anomalies over the United States. So that was interesting. But um, uh, my mom was uh, just... Uh, pretty much geeked out on UFOs by the time that I came along. And so I think um, part of the, the reason is that she was an experiencer herself, but she always said, oh, I, I had this dream, I had that dream. And, uh, you know, but uh, I, as I got older, I realized that her dreams were like my dreams, and how come we're dreaming the same dream on the same night and doing the same thing? So uh, uh, my uh, grandmother also, when she was 100, I was, she was 104, and I went to visit her on her birthday, 104th birthday, and she was in a, a nursing facility, and for just a split second, she was talking about how she was, uh, they had a farm in Nebraska, and sometimes the Native American kids would come and knock on the door because uh, they could smell her bread baking, and she would give them a loaf of bread. And and then she said, but those little gray guys that came into the kitchen, no, they never wanted a loaf of bread. I'm not sure what they wanted. And I went, what? <laughs> Excuse me? What gray guys? And by then, her little adult mind went off into, uh, a, you know, another subject. But uh, it, it could have been generational. And, uh, you know, so uh, I uh, remember as a very small child uh, an episode, which I always called the cow in the kitchen. And this is one time, and I remember in the morning, I was standing next to, we had a big picture window uh, in Astoria, Oregon, we were up high on a hill called Fern Hill, and it looked down over the Columbia River. And uh, 
I remember standing at that big picture window. We were watching the Columbia River, and there were like these popping things. And, and uh, my dad said, oh, that's ball lightning. And, I, you know, I've seen ball lightning. It really didn't look like this. But my mom and I, uh, I was home because I was too young to go to school then. So I must have been probably about four years old. And uh, then um, pretty soon uh, my mom is in the kitchen and she throws me under the kitchen table. And I could hear scuffling and, and stuff. And she pulls the, the uh, tablecloth down. So that I'm like in a tent under there, you know, I can't see anything. And all I could see is like every once in a while, I can see my mom's shoe come across or, and, and it's like she was dragging her feet. It wasn't like stepping. And uh, <clears throat> I remember that speckled the linoleum floor with my mom's shoe. It was a very vivid memory. And then, uh, you know, I, and everything got really quiet. And so I lifted up, uh, bless you, I lifted up the corner of the tablecloth. And just as I saw it, there's like these two big black eyes looking at me. And uh, I always thought it was uh, a cow had gotten into the kitchen. And this is, uh, you know, a typical of a screen memory that, you know, when Dolores Cannon uh, did a regression on me, I came and I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's not a cow in the kitchen, as those are the big black eyes of an ET, and and they've come to the farm, and I'm I'm not sure, you know, as a four year old, what they're doing there, but after they left, I remember my mom gave me some uh, baby aspirin, and I'm thinking to myself, why is she giving me baby aspirin? I don't have a headache or anything, <laughs> you know. But she just thought that I needed some sort of calming down because she needed to be calmed down after this encounter and, you know, whatever it was. And then uh, probably about two years later, uh, my mom uh, got a phone call in the middle of the night. And I know I was about six. Uh, I was in first grade and first grade was about to start. Uh, so this is the end of the summer, and my dad got caught driving uh, under the influence. And back in those days, uh, you know, early 60s, they, you know, they gave you a slap on the wrist and a you know, $25 fine and sent you home. Well, the, the car that, uh, you know, he ran it into a tree. And so he was waiting at the police station for us to come pick us up. And uh, so it's, like I said, it's early in the morning, probably two in the morning. My mom gets this call. And so I volunteered to go with her. And I volunteered because it was raining outside and I got a chance to wear my brand new red boots that I got for to go to school. And uh, so we get in the car. And we're driving, this is in um, Astoria, Oregon, is very windy. Uh, it's, it's a rainforest, and it was really, really raining hard. And I remember the, the swish of the windshield and the um, Petsy Klein music on the, on the radio and, and the smell of one of my dad's cigars in, in the ashtray. I mean, it was all very, very vivid. And uh, suddenly, um, we were just, the car just stopped. And my mom tried to start the car, and the lights went out. And, um, you know, it was very, very dark. And we were just sitting there in the rain. And my mom is, like, you know, flooding the engine. She's pumping the gas. She's trying to turn it, and it's nothing. And then there was a really bright light. And then the next thing I know, I'm laying across, and back in those days, it was a bench seat, it wasn't a separate seat. I'm laying across the bench seat. My mom is sort of laying over me, and uh, the sun is shining, and the, the windshield wipers are going squeak, 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 and there's no radio, it's just static. And uh, uh, the sun was up, 
And uh, so we get in, you know, my mom starts the car, no problem. We drive, we get there to the uh, um, jailhouse and my dad is just like livid because it was four hours later, it was six in the morning or thereabout. And he wanted to know, you know, why it took us all that time but I don't know what happened during that time, but it has all the classic signs of, um, you know, it has some sort of uh, close encounter. So, you know, those continued through my life. I, I was just talking with a childhood friend earlier this morning about the time that we were out um, camping in her backyard. And uh, I think, you know, her dad must have set up a little pup tent for us and stuff. And we were, uh, we had our little bed rolls and we were outside and it was actually too hot in the tent. Uh, so we were laying outside on the grass and we're watching the sky. And uh, the next thing I knew, I am walking behind her and I could see, see her. I'm, I'm being told not to look up. And I'm watching her, her feet and, uh, you know, seeing her bottom of her pajamas sort of drag on the ground. And then there's another child there, too, but I'm told not to look up. So I don't know who it was. And it could have been my brother or her brother. I, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? But um, when we got to this place, uh, we were sitting on a... a I, I want to say that we probably brought a board of shit. And the first thing that we were told to do was to play with these other children. And that didn't last too much, too long. They were, they were not interested in playing or, you know, talking or anything. And, um, I, I, I believe that they were hybrids. They had, you know, kind of stringy hair and they had um, big eyes, but, you know, otherwise they looked like, you know, any other kid. And uh, then um, we went into this room and we were told to stand in front of these uh, squares that were on the ground. And from those squares up sprang like these tables and they'd come about, about uh, chest height and they had this soft glow about them. And we were instructed to put our hands into, you know, over this light and it would bring up frequencies and the frequencies were like sounds. And we could play something that really almost sounded like a string orchestra or something. And uh, so they taught us how to do that. And then the next thing I know, I'm, you know, we're just back, back uh, and I'm walking on this, on the cement patio I could feel the heat of the cement patio but you know I don't know how or where or when um, th this was happening but I I do remember the man that um, was teaching us how to do these frequencies and what he looked like was a tall white or uh, it could have been like a, a Pleiadian or you know it, but it it was very humanoid he is very kind. Um, I don't know. Maybe he's from Venus. Who knows? Uh, but, you know, that's the thing about having ET experiences. They never say, oh, hi, I'm Zork from Ork. That just doesn't happen. You know, unless you think about what to ask them, uh, all the questions go out of your mind because you're like in an altered state of consciousness that, uh, you know, you're almost between worlds, as, as to speak. And it's hard enough just to put one foot in front of another and to follow simple directions as to start thinking, oh, well, yeah, can you draw me a star map? And, and usually the people that, uh, like uh, uh, Betty and uh, Kathleen Martin's uh, aunt, um, she, uh, you know, she had the wherewithal to ask all kinds of questions of the ETs. Well, all I can say is she must have been used to seeing them because, you know, every time it's it's sort of a surprise and 
and uh, you know they don't knock, they don't you know <laughs> ring the door, but they don't send you a text and say they're coming. Usually before they come, though, I do get signs. Like uh, um, one time, I I got a I, I came outside here, uh, right where I'm sitting, and I looked down, and there is the largest praying mantis I'd ever seen in my life. That dude was like six, six inches long. He was like this. And um, and I thought, God, oh, that's, that's really crazy. Uh, and then the other times, I usually get a taste in my mouth that would be like, um, well, if burnt popcorn were electricity, it would taste like that. So, you know, it's kind of this burnt popcorn kind of, electro, you know, electric something burning. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, and that is probably uh, lighting up the electromagnetic center in our inner ear or, you know, in the pineal gland. And, you know, they give uh, some sort of... Uh, message of yeah you know buckle up we're going to go for a ride and this is what we're going to do so anyway uh things like that happened all through my life how about you are you a contactee uh yes i am but not like most people i'm a little different <laughs> uh. Well, every experience is valid, and, you know, uh, I, I used to tell my clients, they come to me, I specialized in regressing uh, people that were experiencers. And part of the reason is because I wanted to know, and, and there were lots of times where, you know, something would happen, and uh, just the uneasiness of knowing that something happened, doesn't, don't know what happened, don't know why it happened. Uh, is enough to send some people to a regressionist to find out if you know if there's some sort of problem. So, and that that's happened. And even myself, I was I was regressed by uh, Yvonne Smith, and I told the story of uh, when I was 20, about 21 years old. <clears throat> I went hiking up to. Um, Twin Lakes in the Sierra Nevadas, and uh, I was with uh, three other people, my boyfriend at the time and another couple, and uh, for some reason we chose the, you know, the campsites that were far away from everybody else. You know, it was like they were halfway up the hill and far, far away from anybody else, and. Uh, so, you know, we were young at the time, and we liked our privacy. So we go to bed at night, and, and I look outside, and on, you know, kind of silhouette on the tent, I'm thinking I'm seeing bears. And, you know, it's like these bears are, are walking around, and I'm thinking there's only between me and that, that bear is a piece of nylon you know it's like the tent is that is it and uh my i had my dog with me and she was growling and uh finally my boyfriend wakes up and and he goes um you know what's that what's that smell or you know or something weird like that and i didn't notice any smell but Pretty soon, the flap opened, and there was this E.T., gray E.T. standing there. And I said to my boyfriend, okay, well, it's time to go. You know, they want us to go. We will just, you know, we are just got a short hike. And um, so I'm just going along, and, you know, and I'm chatting away, talking about the flora and fauna, uh, you know, with this E.T. that's not answering me back. But I turn around. And I see my boyfriend, and he's got his head down, he's got all his hair down, and he is like barely conscious. And they're kind of, they got him underneath his elbows, I mean, his armpits, and uh, he's being dragged along. And behind them is this other couple, uh, Cindy and Mike, and they're being dragged along too. And I'm thinking, oh, those babies, you know, what's wrong with them? You know, you fight them, and 
and they told you it's time to go, it's time to go, you know. And so I just, I just, I, at that moment in my regression, I was just very disappointed in them that they didn't have the courage to find out what it, it was all about. And, you know, it's like my mom would always tell me, well, this is, this is the greatest story since uh, Jesus Christ walked the earth is that there are ETs amongst us, and there are a lot of them that are here to help. And there are a lot of them here that are actually, you know, humans walking around that are uh, volunteers, and that's what uh, got me interested in uh, Dolores Cannon, because she, she followed the three waves of volunteers. This is something that I grew up with, as a, you know, as... <laughs> As a preteen, uh, my mom was talking about the waves of volunteers that were coming in. And what this is, is there was a great call that went across the uh, universe. And they said, oh, yeah, you look over here. There's this planet, this planet Earth. And it's going to go through some, you know, uh, 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 it's going to change Calayuga. You know, it's a big calendar change. They really need to jump the shark. Uh, it could, you know, be... A mass depopulation event, or it could be, you know, a, a higher consciousness. We need people over there to help. Uh, and so the last time they sent um, somebody, uh, he was crucified. And that was the last time one uh, age changed into another. And uh, now we're changing into the Atlant from Piscean age to the Atlantean age. And so, you know, you're going to see a lot of people that are just being, uh, you know, figuratively uh, crucified for their beliefs and uh, what's what's going on. So, you know, uh, there's a lot that the exoconscious human can do. And I do see and have been told by the ETs, you know, buckle up, buttercup. Yeah, you're, you're in for a ride. And I really thought that it was going to be 2012, but do we really know what year it is? And uh, you know, unless unless you were a, a, a shaman or John Calaman or studying the, the ancient uh, pyramids of Mexico, you may not realize what year this is really. Uh, and we can go back and talk about um, the Gurdjieff group. Uh, and you know secret societies and and the fact that at one time there were several different calendars in the world and they decided well we're going to go from uh you know the astral calendar to this julian calendar and so they erased the 10 days in october right the 10 missing days that everybody's been looking for for you know eons and eons it's like everybody just woke up and said, okay, we're going to, everybody's going on the same calendar. And so today is October 6th. And, you know, and the other people are saying, no, no, actually it's the 16th. But um, no, they had to get everybody on the same, you know, the same length. And uh, so this is one of those um, markers um, projection mar markers of, of change uh, that the ETs have always been looking for. But uh, yeah, so as we know, uh, by the, uh, the change in, in our uh, uh, cosmos here, that, um, you know, something big is happening, something big is coming, something, I mean, the illusions, um, Eskimos up there, They've been watching the skies for, for generations. And back in the 70s, they were saying, hey, you know, the constellations, they're changing. And, and our North Pole is marching steadily into Russia. And <clears throat> so now uh, Russia is going to make a third capital where this North Pole is. You know, there's uh, Moscow and there's St. Petersburg, and now there's going to be this new um, capital. And this was all predicted. I mean, you know, a long time ago, Casey even talked about it. 
And uh, so there's the earth changes. It isn't about how much car, how many cars you drive or what kind of gasoline and all of that. Yeah, you know, we shouldn't pollute the earth. Yeah, right, right. We know how to not pollute the earth, and that's true. But as far as climate change, that's not man-made. That is cosmo made. It, it's it is a cycle, and we're going through this cycle. The ETs know it, and they're trying to, um, you know, they're trying their best to guide uh, people through it. And so I get a lot of clients that wanted to know what their download was, and you know what uh, what happened. And you know, generally, when they ask those questions and they're under regression. And they're saying, oh, you know, what's my purpose? What's my download? What's, you know, what's going on with me? I have to tell them, uh, you know, exactly what they what they're telling me. And that is if it, it's like you I give you a cup of sugar and you can't just take that cup of sugar and just consume it all at once. Uh, it, it's like impossible. But you can take that cup of sugar and take you know, like a half teaspoon at a time and over time consume that cup of sugar and not feel so bad. But, you know, uh, it's the same way with with the download. If if you got all of that information at once, you'd probably hide in your closet and not come out, which is, you know, sort of what Chris Bledsoe did when he got his download. <laughs> and, uh, so um, yeah, he's a great guy. Uh, so do you have any other questions? All right. So uh, what I would suggest is that since the most interesting thing you've said so far is your own experiences, uh, I would like you to go back through more of those and keep going through those if, if you have more that are um, – memorable and uh, interesting. Th those are always fun to listen to. Okay. Well, I can tell you the story of how I got to Sedona because everybody's got a great story about how they got to Sedona. And um, I have to I have to admit that uh, my story is pretty way out there. And it started, uh, this is like years ago, like, you know, maybe 30 years ago. Um I, I met Melinda Leslie, and she was doing classes at this place called Learning Light. This is when I lived in Southern California. I lived in Yorba Linda. And uh, so I would go to uh, uh, these classes at Learning Light, and I saw where uh, uh, one day, and this was, let's say, in uh, 19, uh, 1998. Uh, I was, it, I, I went to one of the classes and uh, they had Max the Crystal Skull there. And I, I've i never even thought about Crystal Skulls up until that moment. And when I met Max and they were offering um, one hour meditations, like, you know, you go in and and you just sit with Max and you empty your brain and, and usually get some sort of vision and download or something. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, so I go in there and I'm being told to go to this, uh, you know, I even got a picture of my mind of a, of a church in Huntington Beach. Well, from Huntington Beach to your Belinda is about a 45 minute drive. And uh, I, I'm kind of so far away, but uh, you know, I was curious, and then and I wanted to see if if this was you know really a thing of you know how I uh, came across um, this uh, this church, and it was uh, a unity church, and. I go in and I'm I'm talking to this one woman and I'm overhearing her. She introduced herself to me as Owl Woman. And she looks like, you know, a typical Sedona person wearing this 
chiffon colored le- leather skirt and lots of fringe and beads and baubles and crystals. And, you know, she was a very nice woman. And uh, she said, oh, well, we're going to uh, we're going to take this um, trip out to uh, Landers uh, to Giant Rock. And the Integratron, you know, is like this unity church kind of thing. Would you be interested in going? And I said, well, uh, maybe, but, you know, my mom used to take me there back in the 60s. Uh, my mom was uh, re- really into George Van Tassel and, and uh, uh, George Ivansky. Uh, and uh, so there were a lot of times in my youth that, that I would go to uh, these UFO connect- conventions out there and and what I remember is George Van Tassel would have like a scaffolding on the outside of Giant Rock and he would climb up and he had like this um, uh, cheerleader megaphone, you know, and he would just yell at it and, and he would say, and now here they all come. And then pretty soon we would see the lights coming in and over Giant Rock and and the base there and we'd see the lights until pretty soon uh, <laughs> sometimes uh, very often times there would be jets uh, that would come out and, and uh, fly around with these uh, orbs of light so I knew all about Giant Rock and uh, George Adamski I used to play with Julia Adams- uh, not Adamski sorry uh, Van Tassel and uh, you know, they had a little um, had a little cafe out there, and inside the cafe was this ice box, and and it had popsicles, and and sometimes my brother would come with us, and I remember getting those twin pops from uh, Mrs. Van Tassel, and and she would break them for us, and. And we there weren't a lot of kids that went, but there were probably uh, at least 10,000 people that would show up for these uh, spaceship conventions. They just drove their cars right up as close as they could. And then they'd get out of the car and they would, you know, walk up to um, the area around um, a giant rock. So uh, uh, she was saying, yeah, you know, we're going to go out there and, and we're going to try to get into the Integratron. Well, yeah, I remember the Integratron, too. As a matter of fact, I saw um, Howard Hughes out there. He's probably 14 years old. My mom wanted to uh, go out to the Integratron and, and uh, see uh, George Van Tassel. And they were having um, one of their, uh, uh, I guess it was like a fundraiser thing that was going on. And uh, so I was sitting in the car because, you know, it was boring. It was, you know, UFOs. And, and all of a sudden, I see this um, plane come down and land uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the, the strip there that was pretty close to Giant Rock. And uh, it was uh, Howard Hughes. And he was all, like, you know, masked up, wearing white, you know, gauze and stuff. And he got out of the plane, and a, a car drove up. He got into the car, and he drove away. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So then uh, my mom comes back from whoever she's talking with at, at Giant Rock and get in the car, and we drive over to the Integratron, which is about three miles, and it's all dirt roads. And it's very confusing because there's a vortex out there that will just suck you in. I've known people have been lost you've gotten to giant rock or trying to get to giant rock and they get completely lost in you know what what uh, dirt road to take and it, you know it's really a confusion vortex and that was i think put in by the ets to um as sort of a fence and um it's like once you once you pass over that deep uh, demarcation line um, you're you're in uh, kind of a I don't know it's kind of loosey-goosey it's there's 
uh, they say that, um, you know, magnets don't really work right. And, um, uh, you know, if you, you brought a compass into that area, often, uh, you know, it won't work. And uh, so anyway, uh, we get over to the Integratron. And I think that my mom almost got lost in one of those vortices uh, coming back because I, I sort of remember back, you know, turning down one road and then backing up and, and going down um, uh, uh, another road. Uh, but we make it over to the Integratron and in, in, next to the Integratron was a double wide uh, mobile home. And that's where George Van Tassel lived while he worked on the Integratron. And I want to say this is um, probably uh, 1970, uh, around there, 69 or 70. <laughs> and um, so we pull in uh, to the Integratron and, you know, there's building uh, stuff all over. The top was still a skeleton you know there was really nothing up there but i remember van tassel telling me yeah you know you never i'm not going to build any stairs from the bottom into the um into the top area he says it would be very dangerous for people to be up there and uh, you know when when this integratron was running and, you know, being this healing machine. So when you go there, a lot of, you know, they make you climb this really narrow, very straight up uh, ladder. In, and, and then you're under the dome and the woodwork is beautiful and the sound the acoustics is really great. You know, that's where um, YouTube uh, recorded their their CD, uh, Joshua Tree, was under the dome of the Integratron. So uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm kind of bumming around, you know, waiting for my mom. I'm really bored. And I'm thinking about, you know, we get to go up to uh, Pioneer Town, you know, this burger place. And, and uh, you know, I'm just, I'm getting pretty hungry. I want to go. And I turn around, and there's that guy in all his gauzy white. He is, like, standing right there. And I saw that he was handing George Van Tassel a check. I don't know how much the check was for, but I do know firsthand experience that uh, Howard Hughes uh, helped to finance the building of the Integratron. And, you know, so... Anyway, um, I'm telling this to Al woman. She goes, oh, yeah, you know, you know, you ought to go with us. You got to go with us. And uh, so I go out there and I with them and I meet this guy, Emil Canny. And he is using, you know, he he went down to Micho Picchu. He's like the CEO of this big corporation up in uh, uh, the uh, uh, tech center of san francisco and uh he um had a vision of the integratron and uh, while he's at micho picha and so he comes back and he asked his you know he was kind of sketched it out and he asked his assistant to find out what this was and she goes oh uh, yeah i found it it's in the integratron and it went up for sale today so he bought it, and I think he paid like 178000 for it or something like that. And, uh, and so he used that whole compound as a retreat for his, his company. And, uh, and, and I met him. He was a very interesting, very esoteric guy. So, you know, I kept in touch with this group. And then one day in 2000, Al Woman calls me up and says, Oh, well, we're going to split giant rock. And I went, you are? You mean that big giant rock, three stories high, been there for six million years, and you're going to, you're going to split it? And uh, she goes, yeah, we're going to, it's time to do this 
this ritual and it's been, um, you know, prophesied that, uh, you know, if we do this ritual, if it splits north and south and everything in the world is going to be okay, if it splits east and west, then we're going to be in big trouble. And we're going to go out there and we're going to do this ritual we're going to split, split the rock. And I went, okay. <laughs> so I went out there. Um, uh, my, I have a very forgiving husband. I had two small children at home at the time. But I went out there and I stayed. Uh, I didn't. I didn't stay with the rest of them uh, in this little house. Now, years ago in the 1960s, all you had to do to get a piece of free land in that area, in the Landers and, and Joshua Tree area, is to build a little building about the size of a two-car garage, and then uh, surround it with by six acres of uh, fencing and you pay the, the taxes on it for five years and then the state of California gives you the land it's yours and so there's lots of these little uh, buildings out there in the desert and you'll see them. a lot of them you know they did turn their little building into a two-car garage and then they built their house uh, next to it over the years and uh, so they're out there in this this little uh, one room home, and uh, I I was there earlier in the evening, and uh, so I went back, and they were doing this drum circle, where they had this huge, uh, it was a, like a tabletop big round drum, and it was on the floor, and and everybody was um, a chanting a. A lot of the people there were from the Agua Caliente or the Apache Nation. And uh, I, I and uh, two others, or Owl Woman and, and this other, I don't remember her name, but we were the only white people there, really. But there was um, a, uh, a black um, Catholic priest who was there and... Uh, there was um, a, another priest from um, from a church in uh, Palm Springs, and then there were the elders from these tribes. And so, so uh, I w I think I would have noticed if I would have seen anybody else, but that was it. But we were drumming around this drum, and this huge ball lightning. Came in the in the south window, bounced on the floor right next to this drum, and went out the north window over the kitchen sink. And it was, I mean, startling is is a, you know a word. And everybody was all upset. And finally, the uh, uh, this guy, his uh, I, we called him Big Jim. He was just this huge Agua Caliente. Uh, I mean, he was like six five, uh, three hundred pounds. A huge, huge man uh, who was the uh, shaman elder of the Agua Caliente tribe at the time. And he says, "Okay, okay, everything, everything, just settle down, settle down." And then, so after a while, people started chanting and drumming again. And then another ball of lightning came in through the west window and hit the wall. And I mean, and, and it was like an uh, earthquake in there. And I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to go home. So uh, that's when, you know, they said, okay, uh, the, uh, the, the rock is going to split. It's going to split between three and five days. And uh, we're going to reconvene here in three days. And and I thought, uh, well, I can't do that. You know, I got my husband's really good, but, you know, I can't wait out here three to five days for the rock to split. So I told Owl Woman, this was on a Wednesday. Um, no, this was on a Thursday. And I told her I'd, I'd come back on Sunday and I would spend a couple of nights and then early Monday morning, it was February 22nd uh, of uh, 2001. 
um, that I got this phone call about four, about five in the morning, and his owl woman and the rocket split. The first thing I asked was, which way did it split? You know, was it north and south, and everything is going to be all right, or east and west? Because he goes, well, it's actually north, northeast to southwest, and and what the shaman was saying is that there's something really big that's going to happen. Of course, there was nine eleven. This was February, and in September. There was uh, the 9-11. And uh, so I said, okay, well, I'm going to get off the phone. I'm going to pack up my stuff. I'm coming right now. So I get out there, and they're doing their closing ceremonies. And and we're having, like, a feast right out next to this um, newly split giant rock. And it's just solid white quartz crystal on the inside, which is probably why it was such an antenna for the ETs is, you know, quartz crystal. Uh, that's that's how we make um, uh, electromagnetic radio uh, frequencies happen. So anyway, um, this woman walks up to me and she said, uh, oh, um, by the way, uh, you're going to go and move to Sedona and become a gatekeeper. And I looked at her and I went, <laughs> oh, really? Oh, really? I mean, my husband had Remax of Central Orange County. We had a beautiful house in um, Yorba Linda. And, uh, you know, I had my kids in Blue Ribbon Schools. I, you know, air, I'm close 20 minutes to my in-laws for instant babysitting. I mean, it, I, I, I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to go to Sedona, and and I had spent um, you know weeks out here at a time, um, as um, you know on vacation and stuff. <laughs> and so um, I go home. I don't tell my husband because this is just too crazy, you know. It's like you're going to become you're you're moving to Sedona. You're going to become a great. I mean, it was weird enough hearing all of the prophecies that and by the way some of, i see them coming true now uh, but all of the prophecies that were given and uh you know and, and they said that there'd be fights over water um there'd be shortages of food there'll be invasion by uh people not of, uh, from our country but other countries and, and and i you know at the time i'm thinking how could this even be but of course this is before 9-11 and uh, now, now it's like uh, pretty obvious. Like, yeah, I, you know, I see what's happening here. So um, I don't tell my husband. I get home, and the day goes by, and and I'm sitting outside, uh, you know, and it's just beautiful. We got the Santa Anas. We're starting up, and uh, my husband said, you know. I'm really tired, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I got a, a nut to crack that is like this big every month, and it, it's just, I am just under a, so much stress. I don't think I can, you know, I, I don't think I can keep this up. And I said, well, you know, what do you want to do? He goes, well, interestingly enough, somebody walked into um, our office and offered to buy. Our, our office, our franchise. And I went, oh, and I said, well, if you, if you sell the Remax franchise, what are you going to do? And he goes, well, you know, I can still be in, in real estate, but I want to just go part time. And I think we should downsize and, uh, you know, maybe think about taking an early retirement. And uh, I looked at him and I went, what? And he goes, yeah. He goes, um, this, you know, we had a, a new build, and he said, um, this house, uh, people are looking for this this house, you know. If they come into my office all the time. I, I have a buyer. If, if we want to sell our house, sell the business and pack up and move to Sedona and just downsize, uh, we could do that. And I, I couldn't believe it. Because here this woman was just telling me that I was going to be in Sedona in six months. So, of course, I said, 
well, I'll go pack. I'll wait for you. And then the house that we um, ended up here, uh, we're on Disney Lane. This is original Disney property that he purchased to film UFOs. And uh, so I'm on Disney Lane. I'm in a passive solar home. We have our own well water. We're pretty much, we can live off grid. Um, and, uh, but uh, yeah, this, this whole house had, had a, a property, had a great story to it. And uh, the woman that I purchased the home from was a photographer for Arizona Highways. And when I walked in the doorway, she goes, uh, I don't know why she said this, but she looked straight at me and she goes, whoever buys this home is going to be a gatekeeper. And I thought, why, you know, those were the same words. And, and what do you mean? Well, it comes to find out that um, right over here, is the um, coordinates for, that were mentioned in the Rendlesham case, you know, when uh, the ET craft came down in the forest, the Rendlesham forest, and uh, Chris, right after Christmas of 1980, and John Burroughs and Jim Keniston went out, and they, they were ordered by the Air Force to investigate this, and they put their hands on it, and uh, when Jim Keniston put his hand on it, uh, sort of like he said that I was seeing if it was really real or if I'm uh, imagining, you know, hallucinating it. And but he, when he put his hand on it, he was downloaded with 30 pages of ones and zeros. Well, this is 1980. Not very many people were up on um, uh, computers and and. Uh, but uh, it it was deciphered by Jim Delatoso and uh, Dr. Claude Swanson. They they deciphered these codes and they got messages. And one of the messages was the nine places in the United States where UFOs were coming in. And uh, well, guess what? That that's right there. That's right there. And uh, when uh, uh, President Eisenhower wanted to do a disclosure film. He went to Disney and he said, "Yeah, you know, uh, we're gonna we're gonna disclose to you to the people of the world uh, about UFOs, and Marilyn Monroe and Mickey Mouse are going to be our ambassadors to the stars." And uh, so Disney says, "Oh, yeah, what an honor! That's really great." But uh, you know, can we kind of slow roll this? I've got you know, I'm, I've got this movie I'm working on and I'm opening this park. And and then as soon as I get things settled, I'll start working on the disclosure film. And so they gave Disney some um, film. And back in those days, uh, in, in the 30s, when they filmed something, uh, the only way to make copies of it is to show it and and then you know, and, and, and then record the original. And this was on this acetate uh, film that would often catch on fire very easily. Is the reason why there were so many fires in the theaters in the early, you know, 20s and 30s and actually into the 40s. But, uh, yeah, uh, he, he got this, uh, this film, and it was original film that was taken right here, right here. Uh, of UFOs that were coming in and out of the portal, and uh, and so we all know what happened. Uh, Eisenhower was uh, left office with a note of you know beware the military industrial complex, and then um, uh, President Kennedy came in. And uh, we were told by E. Howard Hunt that, uh, who said on his deathbed that JFK was killed over the UFO file. And, you know, that, that was the reason that he was killed. And so they came to Disney and they said, uh, yeah, you know, I'll take that film back. And Disney said, what film? And uh, they said, you know what film, we know that you know, and, and you were given this film, it's, 
you know, been checked out of our library. Here it is on your library card. And uh, so uh, Disney kept on saying, no, no, it's not. It's not here. It's not here. And uh, he had a, te- uh, a home. Disney had a home in Sedona, very close to Thunder Mountain here, which is you know, another name that he <laughs> that he took to name after he, one of his rides. But uh, he uh, had a home there, and it was burned to the ground in 1977, and with the message of "We know where you live. We want the that film back." And um, I was told that the film was returned to the DOD and they were not able to make a copy of it. So that's the story of Disney Lane and uh, why I'm here and how I got got to Sedona. (coughs) Uh, Shortly after I got here, I invited my friend Melinda Leslie, who is a specialist in um, my labs, and she's got a a, a, a company here for... uh, UFO night tours and when she came I said oh god that's so great because I had been doing some of them but not with night vision goggles just with plain um, binoculars and I would take people out to Bradshaw Ranch and it you know it just got to the point where I really I really didn't want to work nights I had a family you know it's got cold in winter time blah 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 all of the reasons I could whine away. So Melinda wanted to come and start this business. So I invited her and she came out to meet the owner of the Center for the New Age. And I was working there at the time um, as a Vortex tour guide and doing the quantum healing regressions and uh, doing readings. And so she came and she stayed in my guest house. And uh, things got pretty weird. About 3 o'clock in the morning, she was up there. She said that uh, she thought that maybe one of my outside lights had gone on or something. And I said, I mean, there's no outside light over there. Uh, uh, this was later. Yeah, but uh, she, uh, she said that she looked out, you know, between the mini blinds and saw that... Um, the yard was just lit up just like daylight. And so she walked outside and the next thing you know, uh, she's up at the high school and, uh, and I, I, uh, woke up about, you know, same time. And there was an ET standing next to my bed. Uh, again, they don't knock or anything. And it was November and uh, they they said, oh, well, you know, can you come along? And and I said, well, you know, uh, I want to put on some sweats. It's November. It's it's cold outside. So they allowed me to put on some sweats. And, you know, I needed to do laundry. I couldn't find anything. <laughs> the next day when I got home, I looked at my closet and, and I thought, what happened here? It looked like there was some sort of explosion. But I did find uh, some sweatpants and a sweatshirt to put on and uh, 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 some slippers. And I remember my dog laying on the floor and she was just had this low growl in her throat, but um, she was paralyzed. I could see her eye moving and watching me. And I asked him, I said, just don't take my husband. He's sleeping so well. He doesn't sleep well at night. Just, you know, just leave him here. But um, later I did see that, he, that my husband was up there, my daughter, uh, Melinda and Melinda's friend. And so Melinda and I, uh, we were sitting together on this kind of transport bus. Um, it, it was just a, a, a nor- you know, if you saw it, you wouldn't think anything. That was just looked like a white uh, tourist bus, um, you know, in one of those shorter time. But um, I get, it, get in and we're you know, going to uh, some place way out. Uh, I believe that it's uh, the underground base um, that doesn't exist outside of Sedona. And uh, while we're going out there, 
um, they kind of have our seat reclined and they're like flashing these uh, laser kind of uh, symbols and, and, you know, and some, I don't know what, how else to say. And it, it just, they, they were just uh, very interesting patterns, maybe, uh, you know, some sort of cuneiform language. I don't know. It was all Greek to me. So, uh, but we're watching this being flashed and they're just, uh, you know, one after another. And I keep on looking out the window, trying to figure out where I am. And, you know, I'm out there all the time as a uh, vortex tour guide. And I, I honestly do not know where we were and, and how, you know, we actually got there. But I was being distracted by these flashes and these symbols. And then once we get there, um, it, it's like a, it was just a mountain. And it was like the mountain just opened up. Um, I, I didn't see any, any doors or anything. But, you know, all of a sudden there's this gaping hole and we drive through. And we get out. We're sort of like on a people mover. It's got like a, a, a feeling of an airport or something. And we get in, uh, onto this catwalk. And when you look down over the catwalk, I saw several tables. They, were, they looked like they were stainless steel or something. They were kind of a dull silver. And um, there were people on them in various states of undress. And there were about three or four, maybe five different kinds of ETs that were moving around and, uh, you know, and, and doing something, leaning over these people. And uh, so we get back into the bowels of this place where they just keep walking us and walking us and, and finally get into this room. It's like a, reminded me of a, a college uh, classroom. And now recording. Okay, so continuing my story about uh, being, uh, uh, having an experience with Melinda Leslie when I invited her to come out and uh, stay in my guest house. Um, we're on this bus and we're being shown these uh, different, um, I want to say cuneiform text. I don't know, what, but it, it, it looked like it was either neon or lasers or something like that. So couldn't, you couldn't take your eyes off of it. It was, you know, really right in front of our face. And then uh, we get to this place, and the road is headed right for this mountain of red rocks. And uh, all of a sudden, there, the mountain opens up, and it's just like this big, black, gaping hole. And you can see lights, like, in the distance. Um, as we're driving in and uh, we get off and we get we drive into the inside of this mountain and um, there's just a lot of ambient light I don't know what the light source was coming from but um, it was you know as light as day uh, and but there wasn't any windows or you know skylights to, <laughs> to think of uh, but um, we got onto this, uh, it, was, it was like a people mover, like, you know, like you would see at a, uh, an air, airport um, where, it, you know, you got on and, and it just, you know, took you where you needed to go. And we got into this one part that was a catwalk and uh, uh, both Melinda and I stepped off to look down into this large room and inside the large room there were um, these silver uh, tables and there were people on these tables in various states of undress and there were uh, I don't know probably a half dozen five or six different ET races that were uh, you know bending over and and um, administering to these people whatever they were doing. 
but we were taken like way, way back and it was like catacombs, you know, we need to turn left and turn right. And uh, we get back there and we get into this room that, we, I mean, it really looks like a college uh, institutionalized classroom of some sort with that kind of, you know, the, the institutional green and, and the, um, uh, the, the tan linoleum, uh, I mean, there was nothing in it that would suggest that it was ET of any kind. And then, uh, they, you know, this was a room where you were just sitting and they had these, uh, tables and chairs and benches and, and, and I, I thought that I was the only person in the room who came in and I sat down and then they opened up, um, these doors, uh, or, or how do I say that all of a sudden the wall was gone. Let's just put it that way. And then it looked really kind of weird and eerie. And, um, there was a, a, a chair that was like a cup and uh, I was instructed to sit down and there was a table and uh, the table was lined in gold, uh, you know, something gold color. And then there was a tower that came up in the middle of this table, also gold color with a, with a circle at the, at the very top of it. And, um, uh, the, uh, I want to say that, that there was a, either hybrids or people that looked, you know, very human that were working with the ETs and one came over and they put this, uh, uh, apparatus on my head and they said, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to teach you how to move this little object and the little object looked like a, a teardrop. It was, a uh, either brass or gold uh, teardrop and they put it on the table and there are different squares sort of kind of squares it was a little more like a plaid uh, on on the table and we were to to take that and then with our mind using telekinesis is move it up and go through this um, circle at the at the top of the tower and then it were, and then come down and land on a particular spot uh, on the table. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, oh, sure, I could do that. I do that all the time. <laughs> okay. So anyway, they did an ET mind mill thing where they, I could, I could feel the ET inside my head and lifting, using um, a certain power in the brain lifting up that little object and putting it through the um, uh, the circle and then putting it on the other side. But the first time I, I did it, I didn't put it in the right spot. So so they did the mind mill thing again and and then I put it in the right spot. And then, they took the apparatus off and they said, okay, now do it on your own. So, you know, before you had the ET assist, now do it on your own. So I did. I did. And I don't know how I did it, but uh, I, I just thought, okay, pick up, go through and set down. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm let out of the room and I'm put into uh the the back you know kind of the same place where i was before kind of waiting in, but it, they sent me toward the back of the room in this desk and and then melinda walks in and they do the same thing with melinda melinda does exactly the same thing as i did and and so she she gets up and uh, she turns around. She looks at me and I give her the thumbs up and she gives me the thumbs up and uh, we leave and we are, we are let out by grace and the grace turn us over to um, some sort of, I, I don't know if it's military 
or paranor or paramilitary or mercenary. I don't know, but they spoke English and they were wearing uniforms. There was no insignia on their uniform. There was no names. It was just, you know, like khakis and, and, um, there's one guy that came in. He did introduce himself to me as a colonel, and he was wearing a blue shirt and navy blue tie, and and he had uh, a cap. And uh, so, you know, um, it was, that that part was interesting. So in the you know everybody comes back, everybody was there, my husband, and everybody went through the same thing, and. Uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning when we came back and I get up uh, and I'm thinking, wow, I just had a, a really great ET dream. You know, that was, that was really lifelike. And I go, get up and I go put the kettle on to make some tea. I was going to make some chamomile tea and try to go back to bed. And then my husband is up and then my daughter is up and then Melinda comes over from the guest cottage with uh, her friend Bonnie and everybody's talking about the same thing. And, and then uh, 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 finally Melinda says, okay, every, everybody, let's not talk about it. Don't sully each other's memory. Um, let's just, you know, table this and talk about it later. And so, you know, I had some chamomile tea. I went back to bed and um, I got up around 7 o'clock. And I could hear Melinda's uh, voice. And so I knew everybody was up and, and going. And my husband was saying, you know, you got to you gotta look out the window over here. And I looked out the window and there was a crop circle in our yard. And one of the things that I have an agreement with the ETs is that they're, they can take me. That's fine. But they have to leave some sort of... Uh, you know, evidence. So I know that I'm not crazy. So, you know, like I said, it was November and we had these peach trees that, um, you know, dropped all of their leaves and they're very, very colorful. And they were, um, that is an area that is just mostly like gravel and, you know, it's just desert. Um, but the trees get watered. So, yeah, anyway, the trees were, uh, uh, these leaves were like braided and they were in a circle about nine feet. And in the very, very center was a wildflower that was uh, about, you know, knee high. And it was twisted in a way that it looked like a centerpiece on a table. And of course, we took photos. And uh, Melinda has those photos, and uh, and I think Melinda actually pulled up the the leaves, um, you know the the centerpiece um, flower, and, uh, and she must have that someplace. And we saved a lot of the leaves. And then that was, like I said, in November. Well, in February is the International UFO Congress, and we decided to have. Um, Yvonne Smith regressed the three of us and that was me, Melinda and her friend Bonnie and so uh, Yvonne uh, regressed us and we all told exactly the same story so you know so this has been um, documented and, and we have this little bit of physical evidence and so that's been really really fun and that's how Melinda has come to Sedona, and uh, now Melinda is well known for her uh, association with the people that were on PTSA. They come on her uh, her tours, and uh, and they talk turkey. So, at the contact in the desert just recently, Melinda introduced me to John Ramirez, who is also uh, part of TTSA. Also. Uh, you know, a CIA guy who was who says that he is an experiencer who is part of this narrative, this of uh, the Grolsch uh, narrative being rolled out right now. So, got that going. Well, uh, thank you for sharing. 
it was an interesting story. I think um, I've heard part of that story from somebody. I don't know if it was Melinda or Lorian or um, Misha or who, you know, I've heard those stories told on various different shows and, and, um, I, I've had gone through an experience with Max. I'm very familiar with Max. So, I uh, know him or it. And, uh, in reference to, um, uh, Howard Hughes, I was interviewing, uh, Earl Anderson, the, Southern California MUFON leader, and his mother was an employee of Howard Hughes, and um, she's, he said that she would go out to work for Howard, for the military, in for Howard for the military, and she would go out into these deep underground military bases in the middle of the desert. He never, she never told him which desert, so it's kind of vague and that's probably the way it'll remain until everything is fully disclosed. So that's, uh, the only connections I can give you to Howard Hughes and Max and, uh, everything you've mentioned so far, and hopefully we can recover the first half of this video. Hopefully that'll come down to, um, so, um, what other experiences would you like to impart that you've gone through, if any? Um, <laughs> well, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna name names because uh, this guy is is really famous. But uh, he came to Sedona. This guy came to Sedona, and you see him on Ancient Aliens, and he wanted to do a march out to the very pentacle of the um of the the crossroads of the gps that was mentioned in the rendlesham case and uh you know i met him at contact in the desert years before so you know i i told him yeah sure i I'd, I'd go out there um but i would only go as far as the high energy point and uh, you know there's no I'm telling everybody right now, there's no need to go to the exact little pinpoint of, you know, crosshairs, uh, because number one, let's not forget that that's 52,000 feet up and they come out at that point. But once they come out, it's like they, they stop for a few minutes before they go off. The only ones that don't stop are the motherships, and they're you know the motherships um, come come down out of the portal, and they just you know they just sit there in the portal for sometimes days on end, and then there are smaller ships, um, scout ships that come out of the mothership, and the mothership doesn't usually come down um, very often, but on occasion. On occasion, I've heard, I've heard, and I've seen um, some photos. And Tom Dongo had a couple of very interesting photos of a mothership. Um, but uh, the um, thing was, is that this guy was coming to Sedona, and uh, he was selling tickets, and you know, for I want to say it was like a hundred and ten bucks you can go with him to the GPS and they were going to activate the portal. And, uh, you know, the first question I had was, um, well, Jim Penniston was given the list of the portals that are activated. So you ain't going to do shit. You know, you're going to get out there and uh, you're going to dance in front of your, your video and pat yourself on the back. That's great. You know, that's, that's fine. Um, but I, you know, personally, I'm going to go to the high energy spot. So, uh, so we get to the place and I get to the, you know, they're going to continue on. I want to tell you, Charles, this place that, that, uh, is the exact 
crosshairs of, of the GPS and people have got their GPS and they've got, they've got the, port, you know, the, uh, it all, all uh, keyed in on their GPS finder and, and they're doing their CE5 and, uh, you know, they're chatting along. That is the snakiest place of all Sedona. It's where rattlesnakes go to get married, you know. Come on, you don't want you don't want to get down there. Plus, it's off trail. It's not you know. There's now a what we call a, a uh, community trail. It's not an official trail that goes to that spot. And every time people make trails through our forest, uh, it you know it it destroys flora and fauna, and you know, and I could go on and on, but mostly. You know, you want to, especially when you're selling tickets, you want to stick to the trails. Don't go off trail. I mean, that's just, that's just rude. So anyway, um, I tried to explain it to them. We got to the point where I wasn't going to go any further. And there was this one kind girl that, that said that she would sit with me, you know, while they, they went on. And I said, oh, yeah, no, you know, don't bother. I'm, you know, go on, go, go, go get your $110 worth. I'm going to sit here for a second and then I'm going to turn around and walk back to the car and go get some Thai food for lunch. And I'm sitting there in the nice shady spot of the high energy spot that I know so well. It's off of Turkey Creek, Creek Trail. For those people that want to come to Sedona, you go, you go to the village of Oak Creek, you go down. Um, Verity Valley School Road all the way to the end to the Turkey Creek Trailhead. You pull into the trailhead, you, um, you follow the road. Uh, it, it's, it's very rough and you really need a high clearance a vehicle, but you follow the road back about a mile uh, or you park on Verity Valley School Road and walk in that mile. Um, but you can, you know, you have a high clearance vehicle, go all the way back. And then it's about uh, a half a mile from the trailhead. You get to this place that is pure slick rock. Now, I was out there with um, one of the original people of Sedona, uh, the first one who said, hey, you know, you all got some vortices here in Sedona. And her name was Paige Bryant. And this is the, one of the first places that she ever took me. Uh, and, uh, you know, she, she had her tours, they were like 25 bucks, um, uh, and, and she'd spend all day with you because this is, uh, early eighties, I guess. So anyway, I got there and I'm sitting in the shade on the shelf and there's a pure slick rock Now, underneath the slick rock, the slick rock has, um, uh, copper in it and, you know, and magnesium and crystal. And then there's quartz crystal underneath the rock and underneath the quartz crystal is water. And when you look down there, it looks like a giant geode filled with water. A very, like I said, very, very high energy spot. The sun comes down and, uh, it, you know, it, it's like this beacon. And I'm sure it's the beacon for the, uh, the UFOs coming in. I'm sure they're paying attention to the electromagnetic energy that comes out of that in that place. It is, you know, you can, if I can feel it, if I take off my shoes and put my shoes uh, and put my bare feet right on that red rock and it's in it like vibrates. And uh, when I was out there with Clifford Mahoudi and I did that, he said, Oh, well, you know, Crystal, the crystals out here, they'll give you a download if you're at the right place at the right time and in the right frame of mind because crystals have a memory. And uh, that's the reason why we use them in TVs and radios and, and clocks and what have you. And so when you, when you can connect with the frequency of the crystals in the ground, you, you get these downloads. And, you, and that's one reason why people come to Sedona for these spiritual connections you know like you don't have to be anywhere you just have to take your shoes off and meditate it's you know easy it's like running downhill so uh 
anyway, I'm sitting there in the nice shade. Everybody's gone off with uh, Mr. Ancient Aliens and, you know, and they're, they're chanting and hoopla. And, uh, and I'm sitting there in the, in the shade and uh, enjoying everything when all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it, it was like the sky tore open, like a corner of the sky just lifted up, and I could see stars. And and this um, craft came in; it came in so close. I pra- I mean, I practically could see structure, and and so I forced myself to stay there until the group came back because I, I was so curious to see, uh, you know, if they had seen the craft. And I, you know, I'd, I'd actually taken a, a photo of it. But by the time that, uh, you know, I set my set my stuff down and, I, I, you know, I, I was sitting there in, in the shade and I had all my stuff a few steps away and my uh, camera uh, was in that uh, backpack. So by the time that I went over there and grabbed the backpack and got back and looked for it, it was it was pretty small. It, had, it just it just looks like um, sort of a boomerang in in the sky. It was it kind of U shaped. Um, but uh, I mean, it was it was incredible. And I I asked every single participant and nobody saw it but they were down there you know <laughs> chatting up the the uh activating the portal but they you know they didn't see the best part so you know you gotta listen to the locals that's all i gotta say you know yeah i i knew it was coming i knew it was overdue and i knew where the high energy spots were i know where cage bryant took me and i know where uh, Clifford Mahoudi took me. And uh, so, you know, I, I hope they got their $110 worth. <laughs> uh, okay, so you got to see something in the sky and they didn't. And uh, so. But I have to say, that there was a girl who was uh, this little uh, uh, Asian woman who who was running with her dog, and uh, she she was very close to me, and she saw it, and I have you know a, I have a, a photo of her or a little video of her explaining what she saw because I wanted yeah I wanted uh, to have a witness. So, so yeah, so there was, I did have a witness to that, and uh, someplace I do have the, the video of her saying, yeah, I, I saw something, it just zoomed by, it didn't look like an airplane or anything, and I just, I didn't know what it was, and it's nothing like I ever saw, it was completely silent, so. So, do you have any other uh, abduction experiences that you want to go over? Um, Let's see. Oh, there was this one time. Uh, this is when you know I tried to I tried to explain to my husband back in those very early days of us dating that um, you know sometimes uh, something very strange will happen to me, and I believe that uh, you know it could be ETs. And, uh, you know, he did what everybody else does. It's like, oh, yeah, what a wild imagination. That was really cute, honey. Um, have you seen a psychiatrist? So uh, even, you know, in, in those early days, I mean, not with my, my now husband, but my, I had a boyfriend before, and he was in government. He was, uh, you know, an elected official uh, in Sacramento. And uh, when I told him that, you know, I was having ET visitations, he made me see a psychiatrist. And uh, that's all the psychiatrist did was offer me Valium, which, you know, uh, I, think, I think I took so that I could trade it for some other, you know, goods and services. But, uh, yeah, I never took the Valium. 
uh, and uh, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, they, of course, the doctor thought I was um, having anxiety hallucinations, and and I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, sure, you yeah, know, uh, yeah, right. So uh, my, I told my now husband when we were dating, and uh, you know that yeah, some, sometimes weird things happen. He goes, well, yeah, well, something weird happened to me when I was a Boy Scout and I was up in the Sierra Nevadas. You know, I don't know what it was, but it, you know, it was pretty weird. And we're all thinking that we might have seen um, a Bigfoot. Uh, Sasquatch and I said well yeah you know they're they're up there is it's a possibility so um, my husband and I uh, took a vacation and we spent a week out at Lake Powell and uh, you know we, we uh, rented a, a boat and um, so we had a lot of lot of time on the ocean and stuff but we were staying <laughs> He had this, the van that had, you know, the camper stuff on the inside. It was um, the Toyota version of, of the um, Volkswagen Vanagon. And, um, and so we were staying in, in that. And, of course, that was our transportation. And uh, we had, you know, just about the last night, it was the last night there at this campground we had to return the boat. So we left our campground to return the boat. When we got back, there was a family that had, you know, snuck in and even though the campgrounds had sold out and even though there was a tag in, you know, in, in our campground, um, this family uh, thought that it, it had been abandoned. And they, you know, they had little kids, two and four and, so we felt bad. We didn't want them, all these kids to be woken up and stuff. So we just decided that we were going to drive back, that we were still pretty awake, and we were going to drive uh, as far as at this time. We were living in California, uh, in Long Beach, California, and we were going to drive as far as we could, and then we'll just pull over and sleep in our, our uh, van. And... Uh, so we were on the 40, you know, we had stopped, we had gotten coffee, um, we had not had any alcohol or recreational drugs, um, we were practically out of money, uh, you know, there's one thing about being in college, it's like you, you vacation until you're out of money. And uh, so we're headed back, and we're on the I-40 near the Four Corners and um, uh, 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 it's about three o'clock in the morning, and uh, the van had, you know, the driver's seat, and then there was the engine with the engine cover in the middle, and and then the passenger seat, and uh, you know, and there's nothing ahead of you, you know, so you're sitting right at at the windshield, and. Um, so uh, we're on this I-40, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, I see this really, really bright light, and it's straight out the window. Uh, it's on the horizon, almost at the vanishing point of the, of the horizon, where there's this really, really bright light out there. And it seems to be... Uh, going the same pace as the car and I'm seeing this and I'm thinking, Oh, I'm just, I'm seeing a reflection, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it could be. And I look over to my husband and uh, then boyfriend and he's, he's looking out there. He sees that bright light. And then pretty soon it went from the size of about a uh, baseball to about the size of a hula hoop. You know, it's like this huge, white, bright light that is shining in from the passenger side of where I am. And, um, the ne you know, so the whole interior of, of the van is, is lit up. And 
the the engine just shudders and stops and all the you know the lights go out um but just as the lights are going out i catch a glimpse of three grays in the headlights you know the car stopped headlights are still on for you know just another second but i see three grays and uh, again, this is something that I, I need to do a regression on because this is what I remember. My husband remembers the same. In the morning, we had scoop marks. Um, it was it was about, okay, so this was happened about three in the morning and about seven in the morning. Um, you know how you just sort of wake up from a daydream? And it was like, we were just daydreaming. We just wake up and the sun is up and the radio is blasting and I'm sitting on top of the engine cover and I've got a, you know, death grip on my husband's arm and, uh, and he's driving. He's sort of slumped over the, uh, the van's um, steering wheel and he lifts up his hand and he says, oh, my God, what time is it? you know what happened to the time what you know what what just happened there we were any further down the road we were you know we were still uh in, in that four corners area but something definitely did happen and i told you that earlier that whenever i have a an uh something with a ufo i tell them to leave me some sort of evidence and you know that I, I you know that something has happened, and um, uh, I was my feet were cold again. You know, it's late at night, and, and uh, my feet were cold. And I put on uh, my, a pair of my husband's wool socks that he uses when he hikes, and I had those on, and they were full of pine needles, and and leaves and stuff so so i had that that i know something happened um someday i'll i'll do a regression or maybe a deep meditation and figure that out but after that um there were about uh four or five times that my husband and i were uh had an experience together and uh, the the ones that that always sort of bothered me a little bit were the experiences that I had with my children, because you really can't, you know, you really can't do anything. <laughs> it's like, and you don't want them to be uh, frightened, and uh, but you also uh, know that. Um, this, you know, this may be your lot in life. You might be a, a volunteer from another planet or, you know, somebody of very high consciousness that has come back and reincarnated to be here at this time. And so I feel like there's a reason. I've, I've had very few negative interactions. I have had... Um, interactions with a gray ones with a robot kind of looking rtd d2 kind of looking guy um and he was yeah he was uh uh not to be uh silenced or <laughs> or ignored um but uh you know you you want to believe that your children are going to be safe and you know even if there's nothing that you can do and this is their karma and their time, uh, but, you know, that offers support. And there was one time when um, my daughter was about, uh, I'm going to say, nine months old. And uh, we, we always had what we call the family bed. Sometimes, you know, uh, when my daughters were small, uh, I just kept them in the bed because... Uh, you know, nobody wants to get up with a crying baby. I, I just, <laughs> I would change him with one eye closed and, 
uh, you know, take care of them and go back to sleep. Uh, so my daughter was in our bed uh, as she was nine months old, and she was sort of sleeping on top of my husband's chest, if I remember right. And I could hear my other daughter, who was uh, almost seven at this time, and she's saying, stop, stop, put me down, put me down, put me down. And I'm thinking, what the, you know, what? So I get up and I go walk down the hallway and open up her door. And I see that she's being floated. She's sleeping on the top bunk of her bed. And she's being floated toward the window. And she's yelling, stop, stop, put me down. And I open up the door and I said, can't you hear her? She said, no. And she very slowly floated back to her bed, you know, and back down on the bed. She, she uh, sat up and uh, I looked around. There were probably, I want to say, five or six um, grays in the room. Uh, some were very, very short and some were the taller grays. And in the corner, there was a um, mantoid. And, and I said, okay, well, you know, whatever you guys got going on, I'm just going to take my daughter. We're going to go back to bed. And they, you know, I could hear them say, fine, go back to bed. So I went back to bed and was immediately asleep. So I know that they were, uh, you know, they still had some sort of control. And then when I woke up, I was carrying my daughter, my, my uh, nine-month-old daughter, uh, under my, you know, just carrying her. And um, with my right hand, I'm holding the hand of this little gray and being led down to my uh, other daughter's bedroom. And when we get down there, we open up the door. My little nine-month-old reaches out her arms at this ugly... <laughs> reptoid looking uh, insectoid uh, kind of person calls by name I, I don't I don't of course remember the name I need to really uh, have a regression on that too I guess but uh, and then and, and wants to be held and I, I hand it over to this being and my daughter's nine month old is just hugging this scrawny neck and I was just like yeah God, <laughs> like, too much. But um, yeah, she she was very happy to see them, and I uh, I don't know what else happened. Those are all just conscious memories of what happened that night. But my husband said that they came in and they woke him up, and he was standing next to the bed, and they took that wand and hit his head, and he saw visions of the earth exploding and, you know, wars and, and you know, and vignettes of, of people that were fighting and, and uh, people that were starving and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Really ugly uh, kind of stuff. And, and he was being asked, you know, uh, do you support this? Because um, this is the path that humans are on right now they're they're not being um you know uh very considerate and compassionate of other humans and you know we're here to teach some sort of compassion so that was his message and uh, uh he also asked him for some uh a lotto numbers and they gave them lotto numbers when I got up in the morning I was looking for a piece of paper to write down somebody's phone number and I wrote it on the back side of that lotto numbers and then I threw it away so <laughs> I didn't know I didn't know that they had given him lotto numbers and you know and a couple of days later he said what happened to that you know that orange piece of paper that was here on the you know, next to the message center, we had these lotto numbers that the ETs gave me. And I went, what? <laughs> I went out in the trash two days ago under the coffee grinds. So anyway, that was funny. Not so funny. <laughs> sort of. Um, okay, so you threw away your millions of dollars. 
Yeah, did did traded it in for you know house in Sedona, I guess. So it's okay. So, is there any other um, events you'd like to impart? Well, the other ones, I mean, uh, I've had some um, pretty intense um, uh, visitations. Just one time, uh, Chris Bledsoe talks about the Blue Lady. And uh, when I met Chris uh, in Pennsylvania in uh, 2011, and he had come out with his story, and he was really... Uh, fighting bad press and stuff, people talking negatively about him. He talked about the story about the blue woman and, you know, she was going to save humanity and it was kind of a Mother Mary goddess kind of figure. And I said, oh my goodness, I have seen a blue woman also. I was, I was out here, uh, sitting practically where I'm sitting now and I was looking over to Cathedral Rock and this is back in the day before the um, the trees had completely obliterated it. I, I could still see the very tip of Cathedral Rock. Uh, now now the trees have completely grown up over it and taken away my view but back then I could see the tip and out of this tip came this really brilliant blue light and I'm sitting out here and, and I uh, there are uh, uh, gardeners in the property store and you know they've, they've got their their lawn mowers and their um, you know all of their equipment and um, and all of it, you know, I'm watching it. It's getting larger and larger. It's in the middle of the day, about, you know, one thirty in the afternoon. And all of a sudden, I hear no noise. Like all of the gardeners must have seen it, too, because they're, I mean, all of it was sudden silence. It, it was so silent that it was almost eerie. And then I hear this, oh, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I look up and um, it's this woman and it looks like blue robe. It looks like Mother Mary. I mean, you know, that's, uh, but all in, all in blue robes, different colors of blue. And I look over and I'm trying to see if I can catch the eye of, of any of the um, uh, gar gardeners that are next door. And they're all, you know, they're not looking at me. They're just looking at their, um, their equipment. Uh, apparently, you know, that <laughs> stopped working or something. And so they're down on their hands and knees and they're they're looking at their equipment and they're not looking at at what i was seeing and but you know um i looked away so very long that when i looked back um uh, it, it was gone you know so uh, i i only got that very very short uh visitation and i I often wonder what would happen if I wasn't looking for somebody else to validate what I was seeing and, you know, just go with it and, and know that I was seeing something um, that was off worldly. And uh, especially because I'm here in the portal, I, I don't know, but I do remember that beautiful voice, uh, lovely voice and beautiful, beautiful. It's just so beautiful. And, um, I, I got a very uh, calm feeling and sensation uh, and carried that for, uh, you know, a few days. And so I, I had something to share with Chris Bledsoe when I met him and he told me the story of his blue lady. I told him the story of mine and it sounds like, you know, maybe they're sisters or something. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, well, um, 
Is there anything else you'd like to go over? <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I'm about talked out. I see that we're at the top of the hour again and, uh, you know, talk for a lot. I, I want to invite people to come out to um, Sedona. Don't call me. I'm retired, but have your own experience. Make sure that you get out next to the creek and take the shoes off and do a meditation and, you know, and, and let just let yourself be um, completely embraced by the earth energies here. Because what I really think is that humanity is at a place right now where we we can handle some new truths and and uh, disclosures. The reason why we're so excited about having a whistleblower, even though it does seem like the CIA is running the narrative and there's something, they're running it for this reason, for a reason, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say, you know, uh, uh, that it's a, a fake narrative because there's the real thing out there so while they are running this false narrative, you got to remember your star seed connections, and the connections to your glorious cosmo family, and you know, and as an extra conscious human, to stay calm and to, and stay calm for others, and you know, let them know that this too shall pass. Um, I'm told that uh, by the year 2026, things will be really kind of calm down and, and you know there'll be a lot of new opportunities and uh, uh, you know the good guys are winning so we just have to hang in there well thank you very much for being on my show it's been a pleasure I will see about either piecing these two together or posting them separate whatever seems to be um, the best thing to do Thank you again for being on the show, and I appreciate your time. And uh, and uh, let's hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Yes, you too. And thank you for inviting me on. It was fun to share all of my stories. I keep saying that I'm going to write a book, and you know, I get I I get started, it goes in bits and pieces, and I guess someday I'll get it finished. But uh, you know, I've rewritten the first chapter about 30 times, so I got to get past that. <laughs> and yeah, th th there's lots of things to um, to explore and discover in, in your life, even if you're not in Sedona. The ley lines go all over the world. Find your power spot is what I tell people. Find your power spot and exercise it and be kind. And with that, I say I do. I do. Thank, Thank you very you later, much. Charles. Thank Stop you very much.